Welcome to the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast. I'm your host, Lydia Morrison, and I hope our podcast offers you some new perspective. Today I'm joined by the brilliant Dr. Eva Nagales, a Howard Hughes investigator and head of the Division of Biochemistry, Biophysics, and Structural Biology of the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. And most recently, Dr. Nagales was honored as the inaugural lecturer at the Donald G. Combe Honorary Lectureship here at New England Biolabs. Dr. Nagales has had an amazing career in the field of cryogenic electron microscopy, a technique that bridges the gap between molecules and cells, allowing the study of large protein complexes that operate within a living cell. Thank you so much for joining me today, Eva. I'm truly delighted to be here with you. I was hoping that you could tell our audience what cryo-EM is and how it informs biological studies. Very good. So cryo-EM, which stands for cryo-electron microscopy, is a modality of this technique that has been used for many years to visualize objects at high resolution using electrons instead of light, but where the cryo refers to the fact that the sample is frozen. Biological samples suffer from two weaknesses when it comes to being visualized by EM. One is that they're wet, they like to be in water. Water is incompatible with the vacuum that is inside electron microscopes. So we freeze them and we keep them at temperatures where ice can withstand those, that high vacuum. And the other is by freezing them, we protect them. It's a cryoprotectant against the radiation damage that is, co- uh, that is caused by the bombardment of biological samples with electrons. So it's a way to study biological samples and to do it at the highest possible resolution where light cannot take you. And what was it about electron microscopy that drew you to this technical field? So cryo-electron microscopy today stands as a new and very powerful alternative to structural biology techniques that have been used for many years to determine the atomic structure of proteins and nucleic acids. And those are nuclear magnetic resonance and especially, most especially, X-ray crystallography. So X-ray crystallography is a very powerful technique that, however, requires large amount of samples to carry out mm, crystallization trials. And you need your protein or your assembly to crystallize in order to get, then get diffraction data from which you can deduce the structure. Unfortunately, there are many samples that are completely resistant to crystallization, either because they cannot produce enough in enough amounts to do all those crystallization trials, or because people have tried and tried and they will not crystallize. And I, it just so happened that the systems that I was interested in characterizing are of that type. One have to do with microtubules. They are a polymer that by definition is uncrystallizable. And the other are very large protein complexes involved in gene expression regulation that by the, due to their size and due to their flexibility has, have resisted crystallization for many years. So what attracted me to this technique was the fact that I could use it to visualize whatever it was that I was interested in. And to begin with, um, when this technique was not as powerful as it is today, it meant that I could be limited in resolution, but to me it was more important to look at the full assembly uh, as close as possible to how it is in the cell, even if I didn't have atomic details. Thankfully, today, there's no such compromise. We can look at many samples and in most cases obtain the atomic resolution that allows us to understand them in great detail. And how have electron microscopy studies um, helped define cytoskeletal interactions such as microtubules that you mentioned? Yeah, so so microtubules are these amazing polymers. They're made of alpha-beta tubulin that uh, associate together forming a tubular structure, therefore the name microtubule. And microtubules are present in all cells and all eukaryotic cells, so all the cells in your body, and they play many different roles. So they are involved in organizing the contents of the cell, 
Um, they are very important for chromosome segregation during cell division, or they can be used to generate structures that actually propel cells like the flagella in a sperm. Um, they do this, all of these functions because um, they have a property that is called dynamic instability by which they can switch between growing and shrinking phases. And this process, although it can occur with pure tubulin, is highly regulated in the cell where microtubules interact with hundreds of different proteins. So looking at how these proteins interact with microtubules is a beautiful type of experiment of goal uh, for which cryoEM is perfectly um, suited. And we've been able to therefore visualize microtubules where tubulin is in a symbol physiological uh, state and see how different proteins bind to that microtubule surface, that lattice of different subunits, how some of them actually bind to the microtubule um, across a number of subunits, serving, for example, as staples um, that keeps the microtubule together, or how some of them can recognize special features that are present at the end of microtubules. These are the kind of studies that could not have been done with this kind of resolution in, by any other methodology. And are the microtubule samples that you are studying, are those in Dodd? come from endogenous sources or are those um, expressed in vitro? So microtubules are pretty abundant in cells. They're particularly abundant in neurons. So mammalian brains, so the brains of cows, especially uh, pigs these days, are fantastic sources and there are uh, great tricks to uh, purify them from there. So a lot of the work that has been done with microtubules in, in vitro have been done from purified uh, neuronal, you know, um, mammalian brains. From the native source. From the native source. Mm -hmm. um, and this was great, but on the other hand, it gave us very little playground to study mutations and to control, um, control what we had because uh, tubulin exists in different isoforms. Mm -hmm. It has many different post-translational modifications. And when it's purified from cells, it comes at this, uh, you know, very confusing mixture. And in fact, the difficult thing was to have an overexpression system because the folding of tubulin is incredibly complicated. Mm -hmm. And it was known, and it is an essential gene uh, you cannot overexpress or underexpress or express a mutant. And for a long time, it was very difficult to have recombinant tubulin. Mm. It's only in the last few years where a number of labs have pioneered the production of tubulin from, from insect cells, for example, um, and that studies of single isotypes or studies of mutants can be done. So we, we've done both. We've done many of our studies with just this purified endogenous uh, tubulin, but we've done more and more uh, with specific isoforms um, from either human or yeast tubulin that have been purified or um, and, and including mutants that we chose, you know, um, in, a, in a specific manner to probe specific functions of tubulin. So both, but the default for many years have been endogenous sources. Yeah. And do you feel like um, do you feel like both offer really interesting insights into the function of microtubules, or do you feel like um, the ability to overexpress in the last few years has really allowed you to hone in on very specific questions and problems? I I think that we've you know it's great to have this source of cheap material, um, but we are opening new doors to new kind of questions now that we have access to recombinant tubulins where we have a lot more control and we can be more incisive in the questions that we're able to to pose and answer with That's this new very material. Interesting. And how has your lab used structural studies to elucidate gene expression and, and regulation? Yeah, so we, we study the molecular machinery that is involved in regulating uh, the expression of proteins. This is a process that um, it starts with transcription of protein coding genes by RNA polymerase. 
uh, RNA polymerase II, uh, in particular, it, it is a is a very lar large complex mm -hmm. of 12 proteins. It's half a megadalton in size. Uh, and it's wonderful that it can um, copy DNA into mRNA, but it's otherwise a very stupid enzyme that doesn't know how to find the beginning of a gene or how to open the duplex DNAs, the DNA to get access to the transcribed strand. So to do this, it requires a cohort of of all the factors that have to come together into what is called a transcription pre-initiation complex uh, around the start site of a gene that is marked by specific sequences that are recognized by some of these factors. And that pre-initiation complex also include um, factors that have ATPase activity that is used to generate work that is used for the opening of the duplex DNA. So these are all very large complexes that come together forming an assembly of about three megadalton in size. They are not, in some cases, they're not, they're, they're, there isn't any expression system. We do have to rely on endogenous materials. Most work has been done either with human in our case or otherwise with yeast, uh, budding yeast um, proteins. And really, CrowEM has been uniquely suited to study it because we get them in very small amounts. They really resist crystallization, and they, in many cases, are dramatically flexible. Maybe that's why crystallization would be so difficult. So cryo-electron microscopy has been able now to describe the structure of all these components separately and coming together, coming together onto the DNA right by the transcription start site. And we've gained, we've been able to get uh, an, um, an amazing amount of biological insight by directly visualizing different stages in the process of the transcription initiation process. And of course, because this is such a large macromolecule, these are the kind of, um, this is the kind of resolution that you wouldn't be able to ever see with a X-ray crystallography study, right? When samples can be crystallized, depending on the quality of the crystals, it may be possible to obtain structures that are a resolution as fantastic as one angstrom, mm -hmm. or that the crystals are limited and the resolution, the order of the crystals or the size of the crystals is limited and the resolution doesn't go past five or six angstrom. It is a little bit the same with cryo-electron microscopy, depending in the case in the behavior of the sample, how sta stable they are, in how many different conformation they exist uh, when we are looking at them, that it is possible to get below two angstrom resolution or get it stuck at nine or 10 angstrom resolution. Um, so for these large, Mm, macromolecular assemblies that are regions that are very stable, typically in the core of the structure. And those we can see with basically atomic definition, while there are regions on the outside that tends to be the more mobile, the arms, the legs of the structure, mm. um, where the resolution can be more limited. But in all cases, we are able to describe the range of motions and that information the dynamics of this molecule is a, a, a new dimension of information that you cannot get when you have a single static picture. So there's typically any structure of something that is as large as one megadalton have different resolution regimes. Some parts of the structure are very well defined and other are a little fascia and we see less well but we can tell that it moves and hopefully we can describe the range of motion, which is just as important mm -hmm. as, as, at the, as the details at atomic level. And how do you deal with the challenge of those um, flexible regions? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when the sample exists in a heterogeneous state, mm -hmm. either because there's different in compositions, for example, there could be a factor that comes and goes from the main complex that engages and disengages. So there are different states compositionally, or especially when you have conformational heterogeneity, meaning there are regions of motion within the complex, um, it's gonna involve, it's gonna require a lot more data and very 
complicated uh, computational approaches to be able to separate the states, zoom in one area and push the resolution maybe one area at a time. Mm. So more flexibility, more complexity means more data and more computation. Mm. And what are the implications of, of this knowledge, of the knowledge about the factors included in the initiation complex and, and the binding order um, and those those flexible regions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm a structural biologist and I find it hard to believe that people will need convincing of how important it is for us to know the physics, the physics and the chemistry of biological molecule, what they're doing, their function. So we want to understand how biology works, how we are alive, how we are what we are, starting from, you know, relatively simple molecules they're not they're actually complicated molecules but that build up the ultimately the complexity of the cell of tissues and organisms and the details of how they interact with one another how they collide how they move how they push how they rearrange it is critical for us to have an understanding of these processes which to me is like knowing the blueprints of how we are made in the say correct way so that when things go wrong, when things fail, when there are mutations, when there are diseases, we can understand what they mean at the molecular level and how we can target them. How can we design therapies, small molecules, gene therapies that will correct from those defects? But how can you fix something if you don't know how it works, how it makes, how all the pieces come together? So that kind of knowledge is just critical, not just as fundamental knowledge, just like we want to know the particles of the universe and the how galaxies are, are made, although they don't necessarily have a particle, um, you know, purpose for our lives. Um, so that exists, that wanted to, you know, being curious about how we are made and what biological life is, uh, grows out of is important but in the case of biological studies there's always a biomedical component is always the fact that this is a a requirement and a a, a basic starting step towards understanding disease and fighting it so you can imagine many uh, diseases have to do with Ex, you know, overexpression or under expression of certain cellular components that are required for, you know, the, the well-being of the cell or to be able to react to an infection, mm. things like that. And if you don't understand how genes are expressed in the first place, how can you modify or understand how that gets dysregulated and how it is possible to fix it? So I think these motions these interactions, they are part, critical parts of the story of how we are made, how our genes are read, which are, you know, absolutely basic for understanding cell biological processes. So I I think we are, we're working on something important. (laughs) I think so too. (laughs) Can you tell us about the story of um, your work on TF2D? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, TF2D stands for transcription factor that works with polymerase 2. And the D, I understand, for the person that uh, discovered it was just the order. Things were being discovered and being called A, B, C, D. In any case, uh, this factor is actually a complex of about 14 different proteins. It has a huge size at the molecular level, 1.3 megadaltons. And it has a number of very important roles in gene expression, in the reading of DNA into messenger RNA, in the reading of of a gene. And the first function is that it has to be able to recognize regions in the genome that correspond to the beginning of a gene, the start of the gene, where the polymerase needs to start reading uh, the message. And then, once it has recognized bound to those regions, it has to have the cap, it, it recruits the rest of the factors, including the polymerase, that are required for beginning the copy, uh, the copying of the DNA into messenger RNA. And it regulates how much 
mRNA is being produced through the in, its interaction with um, gene-specific proteins, transcription factors, that are, act at the end of a signaling cascade to respond to the need of the cell that tells this particular gene has to be produced now in large amount or it has to be otherwise shut down because it's no longer needed or, 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 this, or it's the wrong thing to be producing. And TF2D is able to interact with these uh, gene-specific uh, transcription factors uh, that upregulate or downregulate transcription, and in doing so, probably change both its capacity to bind to DNA and its capacity to recruit the, the polymerase to therefore regulate gene expression. And it does this very complicated set of functions by having a large architecture that includes mobile regions that are able to respond to different signals to provide different outputs in terms of affinity binding to the DNA and capacity to recruit the polymerase. So now that you've done such incredible work to help elucidate sort of the complexities of that pre-initiation complex, um, What's next for your um, work on gene expression? Right. So, you know, I think something that is fascinating about biology and that we as humans have yet to be able to imitate to the same degree is the capacity to adapt and the capacity to add regulatory layers. Um, I think many of those here in this podcast will know that the number of genes that a human being has compared to, I don't know, a plant or, or, or a budding yeast unicellular organism is not very large, but that they're able to use that genetic material in a way that gives them a lot of flexibility and that allows for further evolution of more and more regulatory processes. So this at the molecular level occurs just like it occurs at the organismal level. And um, so far, the studies that we have done on TF2D are of the very, very, the most basic aspects that have to do with the DNA uh, recognition and a little bit on what it involves to recruit the, the polymerase to the site. But how is activity is regulated? in a larger context where there are other factors that are involved where it's not acting just on DNA, but on chromatin, which is a much more complicated structure where DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes that have different colors, if you want, that has to do with the way the histone proteins that make the nucleosome and wrap the DNA have been modified and painted in different ways. Um, they all act to regulate gene expression TF2D is interacting with all these different factors and those that level of added complexity of regulatory elements um, that is at the heart of the regulation that allows cells to adapt and cells to become, you know, respond um, to, to the environment or, or the needs of the organism. That's what we are starting to study now. We started with the basic and now how is all of this regulated and controlled? How is this activity increase or decrease? This is what we will be doing now, and we will be doing it in the, in the context of, of chromatin that most closely resembles what it has to face, what is in the nucleus of each one of our cells. That's very interesting, and um, I look forward to seeing more work from your group about that because it it is amazing to think about how um, the size of the number of genes encoded in our DNA is not that different from um, <laughs> far more simplistic organisms, mm -hmm. um, and that those those subtle molecular changes are what's really regulating the differences between humans and plants. Mm -hmm. How important are collaborations to the success of your research? Right. Um, you know, sometimes um, I get really amused by the way Hollywood portrayed scientists. I think all scientists <laughs> there's, do. There's one, you know, it, it makes me feel that, you know, the way they portray other profession is probably just as flawed. But, uh, you know, scientists are either this malicious, mm, crazy mm. scientists that are set there to destroy or dominate the world, 
which honestly, it rarely happens. Um, and the other is that, you know, you have this, this single uh, beautiful girl or single handsome man that one day just having coffee start scribbling something in a napkin, uh, in a paper napkin and come out with a solution to the energy crisis in the world. Nothing happens like that. Science is by definition collaborative. It is a team effort. It's a team effort from the point of a single project having several people working at the, from different angles with different expertise at the level of laboratories where different projects are inter intercalate and people pass along their, their experience and their know-how and their opinion and their advice and criticism. And then it goes beyond labs. And it is very common that scientists interact with one another and they do it across universities, they do it across countries and across continents. And it's the beauty of science. And, you know, everybody has to realize that, you know, to become a scientist, you have to study for many, many years. You become typically quite specialized because we are, you know, getting more and more detail and it's harder and harder to, to push the barriers of, of our knowledge. And it is really fantastic to be able to to interact with other people that have been focusing on different things or in or um, trying to answer similar questions with different tools and how that coming together has a value that is goes beyond the, the sum of the parts that is synergistic, I think is a word that we love to use. So uh, collaborations have been very important in my life and my scientific career. In some cases, through a collaboration, I've opened completely new areas of research in my lab that then has become you know, mainstream that, but at a certain point it was just someone approaching me and telling me, you know, look at this that I'm studying, it's so interesting, could we work together on it? And, and then they, they become really part of my scientific life. Uh, to uh, situations in which I have questions that my own expertise cannot answer and I can team up with someone. It's just, uh, it is one of the f my most favorite um, aspects of, of my job. The fact that I feel unlimited to whom I can approach uh, and who I, whom I can engage uh, to get science done. And we were talking through the day about many different things and one of the things that we mentioned is that I think scientists will make for wonderful diplomats. They judge each other by their intelligence, thoughtfulness, dedication, and ultimately their results and the, the strength uh, and the rigor of their science, not by any other means. They are able to take criticism, they learn from failure, and you know they really love to work without barriers. We collaborate with other places, we bring into our, lab, into our labs people from all countries and all cultures, and the richness of that mixture cannot be understated. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. And I think that um, global scientific collaborations are really what has driven some truly powerful scientific breakthroughs. So um, it's wonderful to see that. And I think you're absolutely right that um, the, the scientists do would tend to be good diplomats as well. <laughs> um, you've mentored so many individuals at various stages in their career um, throughout your own career. Uh, I'm curious what advice you would have um, for girls and, and women who are pursuing careers in science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I will tell them that I would not be happy. I can't imagine being happier doing anything else that I, I hopefully has come through as I answer these, your previous questions. Uh, I feel very passionate about what I do. Every day is different. And my day involves interacting with young, intelligent people and learning every day. So what can be better? Um, but it is true that science can be frustrating because you are pushing the limit of knowledge with the limit of the technology that is available to you at any given time. And we do have to deal with failure all the time. So it is very important that you come to science with um, with self-esteem, 
with appreciation of who you are and your capabilities, that you don't take failure as personal failure, but as an opportunity to learn and to realize that you are really moving that barrier of knowledge and breaking new ground. So my, um, my recommendation will be, you know, let your curiosity and your wish to make discovery drive you and energize you. Um, be resilient in the in the in face of of of, of failure because it's going to happen. We have to deal with it all the time and repeat exam experiments and rethink our questions um, and and you know destroy our models and start over again. Um, and just believe in yourself and don't be ashamed of show off your your capacity um, and don't fall down into the self-doubt well for more that is required to just you know spark new new ideas and while being humble you know, being in pursuit of, 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 of what you're passionate about. So be resilient, be enthusiastic and passionate, and don't let anybody tell you that you cannot do it. Uh, then you'll do fine. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ivan Nagalas, it has been a pleasure and a joy to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us for this episode of our podcast. As always, check out the transcript for links to further resources. And please tune in next episode when the mentors and team members from the Genes in Space program are here to share how aspiring high school students are awarded the opportunity to send their experiments to the International Space Station. <laughs>